While the view of the river Niger floating through this part of uh, Bamako is spectacular, and life is going on about its daily routine in the, in the city of Bamako, other parts of Mali is currently engulfed in a deadly conflict between different jihad insurgencies and the armed forces of the Malian state. We have gathered here to talk about the manifestation of violent extremism in Mali and neighboring Sahel countries like Niger and Burkina Faso. But perhaps also more surprisingly, why pe people even in the most enabling environments where people have so many good reasons for being angry are not radicalized, but in various forms tries to resist and remain resilient. Since 2012, the history of Mali is one of violent extremism in the form of jihadi-inspired insurgencies, but it is much more to this story than headlines of violence and destruction. My name is Morten Bøos, research professor at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, NUPI, and the principal investigator of the PREVEX project, a project funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 program. Our project aims to understand both the drivers of violent extremism and how local communities respond and resist through various ways of expressing resilience. And with me here at the bed of the river Niger, this mighty waterway that floats from the high plains of Guinea through Mali and Niger before it makes its way to the Atlantic Ocean through Nigeria, is my good friend and colleague, Dr. Abdul Wakab Sisse. A senior researcher at ARGA, the Alliance for Good Governance in Africa, a think tank and independent research institute with offices in Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso. So, Abdul, we are here in, uh, in Mali. What is the situation right now? Jihad, the insurgencies, as the Genim and, uh, and uh, ISGS, have, if not territorial control over large parts of the country, at least huge influence in both the north and central parts of Mali. And a large international presence since 2013 has not prevented this from happening. So how can we explain this? The international attention to Mali, on Mali, has never been larger. But if you, when we look at the situation from 2013 and onwards, it doesn't seem like this has helped. It seems like it has only get, uh, get, uh, it's only getting worse. Mm -hmm. So how, how would you describe the situation right now and what has brought about it. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Boas, for hosting me here, uh, like you said, and uh, close to this river. I think uh, to understand, uh, to answer your question, uh, what we can say is uh, right now, there is uh, some areas in the Malian territory that are, let's say, Perhaps they are not under uh, total control of these groups, but we know that these groups have a very strong influence in these, uh, some of these areas. So, uh, and uh, when they, uh, they are in those areas, they control them, they have some type of uh, system of governance they are trying to implement. For example, uh, the most uh, uh, well-known practice that they are implementing is, for example, dress code that they impose to men and women, etc. But there are other, other type of practices that are related to government. So it looks like for some of them, they try to uh, supplement the, the role of the, the state. Uh, for example, in delivering some type of services, etc., etc. In, in what way would you say, because this is very interesting, we talk about that they are trying to sort of supplement mm -hmm. or sort of take over the role of the state. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, often when we hear about these uh, types of groups, I mean, people think about Al-Qaeda and, mm -hmm. uh, and Daesh, the Islamic State, mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the, what people get in their, uh, in the, in their eyes is these uh, headlines of violence and destruction. Mm -hmm. And many people see these groups as completely anti-state, mm -hmm. anti-modernity. But what you are saying is that, in fact, they are almost state-like in some of their practices. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, um, I think w w what we have seen on the ground in the field work is that, uh, you know, uh, as I always say, Mali is, uh, I think, size matter in, in Mali, because Mali is a huge territory. Yeah. Uh, I always compare Mali to Senegal, and I was saying that to my students that 
um, Mali is more, almost seven times the size of Senegal. So uh, it means that in, type, in, in, in terms of delivering services, basic services, the state is, having, is struggling because uh, the budget deficit, etc., could explain the fact that the state cannot deliver some type of services in some of the area. And if you look at, uh, there is a kind of correlation between the area where the, start, uh, the state is lacking of delivering services, and it is, it's in those areas that you will find the prevalence of these groups. So it means that these groups know that uh, there are some type of grievance or frustration that this population has towards the state. So they're trying to exploit those type of grievance to negotiate a type of local integration. Yeah, so what you are saying is that this is not necessarily only about the religion. Because when you hear about these types of groups, I mean, from what uh, the headlines of uh, what we saw uh, from Iraq and Syria and so on, it's so much about Salafism, Wahhabism, mm. uh, Jihadism, uh, uh, extremely violent expression of one particular religion, mm. Islam. So that these people are often put portrayed, everybody that belongs to them, as Islamic extremists. Mm. And I mean, these groups, I mean, they are inspired by, how should I say, uh, the, the, a, a violent Some, type of Salafism. Yeah. But what is exactly the role of religion as a driver? Okay. Uh, I mean, is it something that can religion explain the initial journey into violent extremism? Or is there something else that is going on here? And in parts of what you're saying, I mean, it seems like you're suggesting there is something else that is going on here. Okay. Um, to answer your question, I think as a researcher, we always based on our statement on facts, that evidence-based uh, situation that we found on the ground. So we run a survey for, in, for the Prevex uh, purposes. I think it's the same. Uh, survey tool that was used in Mali, in Niger, and in other countries mm. such as Iraq or Bosnia. So what we found out is, of course, religion play a role, but it's not only religion that uh, move like these youth into this journey of extremism. And let me say that uh, the survey also showed that you can be extremist without being violent. Mm. Uh, so I think this is important to, to stress. So the religion is a fact, but also when we ask people what are the, if they know, for example, uh, somebody who joined these groups, etc. Uh, of course, most of people we we surveyed show that they have, they know somebody who somebody from their family joined or have some experience with these groups. And of course, very often the reason that they are uh, providing is sometimes, um, of, of course, it's the youth mostly who are targeted as the one who join these groups. And the reason mostly um, they stated is that some it's a lack of opportunity, lack of jobs, lack of education. Uh, so it means that it's religion has play a role but it's not exclusively about religion and i think this is important uh, regarding the type of let's say solution that mm. states can explore to address uh, this, this challenge. I, uh, I agree because i have also, of course also looked at this data mm. and i mean uh, as you rightly point out i mean when people who know people that has joined this ask this question about when we ask them to rank mm -hmm. in importance various factors. I mean, very, very few people uh, point towards the religion. Mm -hmm. It's much more about lack of economic opportunities, uh, lack of education opportunities, mm -hmm. lack of jobs, mm -hmm. uh, changes in cattle markets, mm -hmm. I mean, land rights. It's all very sort of genuine material Bunchy, grievances, yeah. in fact. And of course, if this is what explains at least the initial journey into violent extremism. Mm -hmm. It also means that we perhaps need to rethink some of the approaches that has been taken to this. I agree. So, 
we have uh, in this project together, we have um, established this concept of enabling environments. Yeah. And by an enabling environment, I mean, we simply mean that, for example, here in Mali and the Sahel, all the factors that according to the literature is conducive to the emergence of violent extremism seems to be present. Mm -hmm. But can you say something more concrete about this? I mean, it's very easy. I mean, both you and I have, uh, are uh, sometimes teaching students. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's very easy. We could go into any sort of undergrad classroom and ask the students to, to make a list of what is lacking in a place like Mali. I mean, uh, it's just to Google some uh, UN statistics on World Bank statistics. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very easy to make that list. Mm -hmm. But what can we say more precisely about this? I mean, if, if you look again at the studies that we have done here, uh, is it, can we be more precise and say that it's a lack of economic opportunities, for example? What, in, in your point of view, I mean, what are the underlying drivers here? Could it be something around, I mean, this about scarce resources, farmer herder conflicts, uh, lack of institutions to govern land rights, cattle rights, and so on and so forth? Yeah, I think it's a combination of two drivers. I think there is a different drivers that were moved these young people into these groups. Uh, uh, lack of opportunity uh, when, for example, I can say it like basically when you grow up in a village, you are like 20 years old, 23 years old, etc. You want to have a type of life project. Mm -hmm. You need, you want to see how you can, for example, um, let's say, help your parents and uh, by getting some type of revenue, etc. So if you don't have that opportunity in the environment, it means that you get frustrated. Okay, and uh, many things social. You have you are as a young person, you are experiencing some type of social pressure mm. because your family, for example, if you live in a family where, uh, let's say, your your dad has like two or three wives, there is a type of competition. Mm. Each wife wants her uh, ki kids to be successful, etc. I think all these the type of factors are pushing uh, these young people. But also the environment, if it's a kind of uh, the unsafety of the environment. For example, if you are in an environment that is almost controlled by GRD group, etc. Sometimes as a young person, you don't have uh, much uh, option. Because other, uh, either you, you are with them or either they think that you are against them and you are perhaps somebody who is giving and provide information to the farmer, etc. Uh, also, you will be seen as a target. Uh, as a, uh, may, there are many drivers. One of the drivers I was just talking about is the fact that you are living as a young person in a unsafe in, in environment mm. where you are trapped between, for example, the GRD group and uh, the farmer, etc. So. Uh, uh, sometimes, as young people, you don't have a lot of option. Uh, either you join the mm. the Jari group, or either you even live live in the area where you are living. So there are other uh, drivers. We have review, like for example, a conflict between different uh, users of natural resources, like uh, fishermen, uh, herders, etc., agriculture. Those are people, and I think here we need to stress also the climate change, how it impacts those areas. Because uh, with climate change, for example, we see some uh, situation where you either have floods, where people will lose their houses, or you have area of where we, you used to have like uh, um, wetlands that are shrinking and people want to dispute these mm -hmm. natural resources. So these are some type of drivers also that can be combined with some type of religious aspect because we, we, we have to acknowledge that there are some groups 
who are like preaching uh, all around in the rural area, preaching some type of new practices in Islam that is uh, very different from the way that Islam was practiced in, in, in Mali. Because we need to remember that Mali had uh, no, Islam is present in Mali for almost since the 11th century. Yeah. So it's not something new in the country. But there is a type of practice in Islam that is, um, let's say, promoted by some type of entrepreneurs, religious entrepreneurs. Clearly, but I mean, you also touched upon this about uh, dispute settlement and so on and so forth. And after all, I mean, Mali is a state. There are state institutions nationally. There are, st there are still some state institutions also locally. And when we, have, when we review some of the findings from our uh, Prevex project, I mean, we also see that state responses to violent extremism or the slight emergence of violent extremism sometimes also lead to the opposite. Yeah. Uh, very heavy-handed state responses where stereotyping certain groups as more likely to be jihadi mm. insurgents than others and so on, mm. often tend to be self-fulfilling uh, prophecies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we are seeing some signs of that here as well. Uh, with particularly uh, certain groups that tends to be more focused on than other uh, other ethnic mm. groups in, in Mali. So what would you, your, your views be about that? So, uh, yes, of course, um, heavy-handed response from the states are, uh, as you said, um, creating some type of, um, let's say, pushing some people to have a type of vigilante mm. uh, attitude. Uh, we saw it on the survey because uh, some of the, I think we had like 20% of responses that are saying, I, ca I will quote, somebody will say it's the state who is provoking them, something like that. Yeah. So you have those, those kind of responses and uh, answers in the survey. So it means that uh, there is a, uh, uh, a kind of it's, it's very delicate on how the state will address this issue because um, if you want to, uh, for example, uh, implement some type of counterterrorism uh, policy uh, with a very heavy-handed uh, approach, it can generate more frustration, mm -hmm. and uh, the risk is also. There is a tendency to target some type of communities also, and this can be, at the end, uh, can push more communities to be radicalized or try to find, uh, let's say, some help from this uh, jihadi group, etc. This is the type of situation we, we found in the, uh, in the ground. So there is, uh, yeah, of course, some stigmatization of some of the community, for example, the Fulani, etc. Yeah, we have experienced that in the survey. And of course, the, this is a difficult balance to strike because, I mean, uh, none of us are naive about this. I mean, uh, as the situation is here in Mali, I mean, uh, obviously, you need to use the security apparatus. I mean, you cannot just say of that, uh, let's make peace. Uh, there is probably can be no peace mm. without some sort of military approach. Yes. But on the other hand, it's probably also like that there can be no... This is not a conflict mm. that, at least I believe, can be won on the battlefront. Yes. There is no ultimate victory here. Mm. So the question is more about for a state like Mali, like a state like Niger, like Burkina Faso, how to strike that balance between, yes, the state needs to use uh, its uh, hard security mm. approaches, mm -hmm. but they also need to find a way of a soft, uh, using softer approaches. Mm -hmm. They need to find a way of, uh, as somebody we talked to about today said, I mean, uh, the state needs also to, to realign with local communities. Yeah. The state needs to show that it is not only a hard force, but also a benevolent force, mm -hmm. somebody that can provide um, more than security, security that it yeah. provides something good. Mm -hmm. So I think the challenge is about finding that balance. Yeah. But 
we have talked now about the emergence and manifestations of violent extremism. But let's turn to the issue of resilience and community resilience in particular. Because I mean, both of us have learned from what we have done in the previous project that even in the most enabling environment where people have genuine grievances and they may have a uh, hundred to thousand good reasons for being angry. Most people do not join mm. violent extremist groups. Most people are not radicalized in that way. I mean, they can be angry because they have good reasons for being angry, but that doesn't also necessarily mean that they are radicalized into violent extremism. So a lot of these groups, even here, I mean, they, most people try to stay away from this mm -hmm. and even resist. Also at times exposing themselves to huge risks uh, to themselves. Mm -hmm. So what promotes resilience in your view, Abdul? When I look at the data the previous projects have gathered, I tend to see certain commonalities of community resilience. And that is that moderate religious practices that still informs how people behave, it's important that that is present, that this is supported by religious leaders, mm -hmm. but this is uh, not enough because these leaders also need to be seen as trustworthy and not being too engaged in corruption. Mm. And perhaps most importantly, they need to produce something that means something to the people in their community. Yeah. So what, but I mean, we have talked about this before, but as we are sitting here now, looking over the river Niger, I mean, what do you think about this? What does these findings actually mean? What, what is their, what is the relevance for, uh, for Mali? How can, we, how can this be supported? Can it be supported, this type of community resilience that we here talk about? Mm. So talking about community resilience, uh, if you remember, I was talking about the fact that Islam is not something new in Mali. So it means that there is, uh, um, let's say, a kind of religious landscape uh, where you can find like uh, some type of uh, practicing Islam that are, uh, uh, let's say, very rooted mm. to, into Malian society. For example, you see uh, some of the Sufi brotherhoods like the Tijaniya, etc. They are uh, still very strong. The Kadriya is one of the oldest Sufi brotherhood and is very rooted in the Mali society. If you look at, for example, uh, all these rallies that are taking place during, for example, the celebration of the birthday of the Prophet mm. in Bamako and even at the city of Mali, it shows you that this is a form of resilience because uh, people are still practicing a uh, type of religion that uh, type of Islam that is not uh, uh, considered as turning to a, a type of extremism. So this is one uh, type of resilience. The other type of resilience that we can find is that I think the, even the, the state is implementing some type of uh, policies, for example, to create uh, some type of institution. For example, the High Islamic Council is a, a key actor today in, in Mali regarding uh, promoting resilience, etc., and being a kind of uh, key actor in the Malian landscape. Mm -hmm. You have other charismatic leaders like uh, Imam Diko, for example, uh, the Sheriff Bouye, uh, and um, etc. The Sheriff Aydara. Mm. Those are very charismatic Islamic leaders that have a type of speech narrative that can help also promote a type of uh, resilience. Mm -hmm. But I think the other way of building resilience is the role of the state. And, and here, the state and also international partners, I think, should help the Malian state mm -hmm. on that. Uh, it's just to help on 
uh, the return of the state in some of the area where the state is absent, has been absent for a very long time. But uh, l l let us then sort of turn a little bit towards the end now to this about uh, the so-called PCVE programming. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, if we are correct that a lot of this local resilience are anchored on these people. And now we are not talking about elites like Haidara and Dikko and so on, but uh, and other on the High Islamic Council, but on, you know, local people in local communities, sort of more local religious leaders, more local traditional leaders, that this is about these, pe these people are sort of the agents, both of religious moderation, mm -hmm. they are, uh, and thereby they are also agents of resilience because they are seen as trustworthy, they are not seen as too corrupted, mm -hmm. and they continue to produce something that is important to people so that people also will try to defend them and the positions that they take. Uh, when, you look at, uh, when we look at all these PCVE uh, programs that has been going on here, and I, I must say that PCVE has become something of a real growth industry, mm -hmm. and Mali has seen more than its fair share of such externally sponsored projects and programs. But how useful have they really been in your point of view, Abdul? Are they fine-tuned to the local context? And are they sufficiently context and conflict uh, sensitive? Yeah. I think um, to answer to that question, we, um, I could can say that there is um, a lack of conflict and context sensitive for some of these PCCB programs. So we were talking about the uh, violent extremism prevention program, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, if they are uh, context or conflict sensitive, I think uh, this program need to d develop more uh, context and conflict sensitivity because of uh, uh, what we have seen is so far it look like uh, they are more focused on, uh, for example, if you look at here in Mali or in Niger where Prevex, uh, where we were implementing the Prevex program. Most of, uh, let's say, uh, these PC programs are more focused on, for example, the, ra the radicalization, etc., etc. But, and they neglect, uh, for me, they neglect some of the aspects that are very critical, for example, uh, trying to provide some opportunities to young people, uh, for example, opportunities of education, opportunity of uh, improving their professional skills, etc., or having a project, life project for in their uh, environment, etc. These are, I think, they need to readjust and reorient this PCV on this, because, of course, there is program of deradicalization, etc., are good for some uh, some, let's say, uh, category of young people who join this group, etc. But as prevention, I think the best way is to try to provide some opportunities of education, of uh, professional skill uh, or project where these young people can be involved, etc. This is my take on this. Thank you. Um so basically what you're talking about here is sort of trying to give people some aspirations of hope, hope. of aspirations for social mobility, yes. uh, for, so, so, for some progress, that this is perhaps more about the lack of development yeah. than uh, anything else. Economic so, opportunities. So, fi so therefore, finally, you know, we are sitting here at the bed of the river Niger that for a thousand years has floated through Bamako. Mm -hmm. What does the future hold? So I would like to challenge us to look into our respective crystal balls. I mean, have we seen the, have we come towards the end of the most recent epoch in the global history of violent extremism? Or is history quickly going to repeat itself as the, as the tolls of rising prices and inflation creates new fertile breeding ground for violent extremist ideas and practices? And I must admit, that I am not very optimistic. I 
as you, I hope for a better future for Mali, for Niger and the neighboring countries. Mm. But I also fear that the window of opportunity that we have to change this, it's getting smaller and smaller. And one thing is this, you know, these economic effects uh, that we are seeing materializing all over the world from, uh, from the war in Ukraine and the sanction regimes and so on. But if we even look a little further ahead in time, towards 2040, for example, climate change effects combined with an ever increasing population. The population of Mali may increase to around between 40 and 50 million in the year 2040. And for me, I mean, one of the million dollar questions is what is all these people going to live from? And Mali is one of the most youthful countries we have seen in the world. So I'm not that really optimistic, but still we need to have hope. There is a possibility, I think, to turn this, uh, this around, but it needs an other type of co collaboration and cooperation between Malian stakeholders and external stakeholders. And maybe, I'm saying just maybe, what has happened here with this, how to say, break with France, mm -hmm. maybe, it all, maybe within it, there is also some hope for some sort of new social contract between Mali and external actors. Yeah. But what, finally, what is your view? Uh, how do you view the future, Abdul? Yeah, I will uh, just uh, start where you finished. There is a kind of new dynamic that we have seen in this, uh, in Mali, but also in West Africa. It looks like, for example, the, the fact that Mali has broken uh, its relationship with uh, French, etc. It's a sign that there is something new, a type of, uh, how, how can I interpret? Of course, there is some populism on, mm. on uh, the move, but also there is a gain of self-esteem. And I think this, uh, this self-esteem uh, building can help on uh, f addressing the challenge that are ahead. Uh, so that's why I'm kind of um, optimistic in that um, uh, perspective. Um, if, for example, there is, a, let's say, of course, the demography of Mali and uh, the countries in West Africa is a, is a problem, is a challenge. But, I mean, uh, there is also a, a strong issue of governance that if it addressed uh, in a right way, I think it it can help mitigate all the, uh, let's say, the, this kind of skeptical uh, feeling that we have. Uh, that's uh, how I can answer your question. So I'm glad that we at least ended on a slightly optimistic note. So. Um, Thank you, Abdul. Thank you. And uh, Thank you. I would just like to say to those that uh, have listened to this podcast and those that uh, have uh, watched this on YouTube, that you need to stay tuned for uh, more findings from the, um, and more dissemination from the Prevex uh, project. And I would just like to wish everybody that took the time to listen to this, to, to view this. I hope uh, that you learned as much as I did from this and uh, I wish you a very good day.